Good morning, students. Oh, thank you. And future students, maybe. And sorry, guys. I was told I cannot turn around, so I will have to speak in this direction. Um, today I'm tasked with talking to you about my discipline, which is statistical science, and how it relates to my journey as a Christian. So if you can all get out your calculators, we will begin. We have to have at least one corny math joke. I'll probably have a couple others, but at least you kind of laughed at that one, so I might whip out other few. So the first thing I need to tell you is what the discipline is all about. There are lots of definitions. My favorite one is that statistics is the science of decision making in the face of uncertainty. It is a decision making science. Well, Jesus says a lot about making choices and we do this every day with varying amounts of uncertainty about our choices as well as about their outcomes. The purpose of statistics is to help us in certain circumstances to make the choices that will give us the outcomes that we are looking for. But we are Christians. We are followers of the incarnate word. So for us, making good choices means making wise, God-honoring choices, prudent choices. Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest theologians and philosophers that has ever lived, talks a lot about wisdom and prudence. Aquinas quotes Aristotle as he defines prudence as right reason applied to action. Aquinas delineates wisdom and prudence in writing that prudence is wisdom about human affairs, but not wisdom absolutely. He sees wisdom about more than just making earthly decisions, but that this is the specific task and role of prudence. So it is prudent decision making that I would like to focus on today as a statistician under the umbrella of wisdom. I'm gonna let the theology department and the philosophy department, you know, fight about the difference between the two. I'm gonna use the two kind of interchangeably today. Now, certainly we make choices every day, but it would not seem that all choices are the same. For example, you in a moment of temptation decide to consume all of your roommate's Coke that is left in your refrigerator and your roommate confronts you on the consumption of the aforesaid Coke and asks if you did indeed consume it, what should you do? What should you do? Tell the truth, admit to the consumption and go buy your roommate some Coke. It's a moral decision. We don't have uncertainty about it. We know what we should do. Don't lie, just go buy some more Coke. There are other decisions that we make, however, that are laced with uncertainty, but are not necessarily of great consequence. You are hankering for a burrito, maybe even right now, and you have a choice. You're, you're hankering for a burrito, huh? <laughs> you can go. <laughs> you can go to Chipotle, or you can go to Taco Bell. Perhaps for some of you, there might be a degree of uncertainty about which burrito would offer you the most personal satisfaction. But it just doesn't really matter. Your digestive system may disagree with me, but it really just doesn't matter. Although Chipotle has much better burritos. Yes. But the choices that we really care about, that cause us the most angst, are the choices about which we are uncertain and which feel to us are of great consequence. Should you ask that person out on a date or not? Yes. <laughs> Generally speaking, yes. But there's some risk involved. They could say no. You would feel embarrassed and awkward. They could say yes. You could hang out with your future spouse or... <laughs> At the very least, enjoy a lovely evening of mini golf. <laughs> now, I don't, student, statistics is not going to help you make prudent dating choices, although that would be an awesome, awesome class. <laughs> but it does help you with lots of other choices. What new medication should I choose for my very sick child? Should I support the latest welfare legislation or not? What is the most strategic and prudent money-saving plan? 
These are earthly questions, but they are important questions, and they do affect our futures and the futures of those in our community, and we are tasked with answering them well. As Proverbs 3 says, we should not let wisdom or understanding out of our sight. I care a lot about wise decision making. I've always cared a lot about making good decisions. I am incredibly pragmatic. And I also like math. I think it's really fun. So for me, statistics is just a really good natural fit. It's a place where I can contribute to the wise and prudent decision making of Christ Church. But even if you don't like math, for the like seven of you that actually don't like math out here, I think we can all agree that the pursuit of prudence is a worthy calling. In fact, Aquinas defends it as a virtue, the virtue of right reason applied to action. As I've lived in this discipline, I've seen that the principles of the science also belong to the principles of prudent decision making. In fact, the language that Aquinas uses to talk about prudence is eerily statistical. He says that prudence is obtaining knowledge of the future from knowledge of the present or the past, that the prudent person foresees the event of uncertainties, that prudence argues sometimes from probabilities, and that the work of prudence is to take good counsel. As statisticians, we are predicting, we are assessing risk, we are quantifying uncertainty, and we are judging information. So what difference does it make for me as a statistician that I am also a Christian? Well, Aquinas talks about this too. He states that my prudence and your prudence is chiefly, chiefly perfected and helped through being ruled and moved by the Holy Spirit. Whether we're making prudent choices in statistical science, relationships, money, or medicine, the Holy Spirit helps us to be prudent in a way that we couldn't otherwise if it were not for the Holy Spirit's help. In fact, we are implored to ask for this help. As James says, God wants to give us wisdom generously. So today, I want to illustrate this, not with a math lesson, but with a story. Although I thought about a math lesson, but then Chaplain Kello said I couldn't do it. <laughs> it would be very bad. Bad, bad. Uh, so this is the story of a time in my life when I had to make a difficult decision, when I was full of uncertainty. And I learned a lot, both about making choices and about being helped by God to make my choices. It all began in graduate school. Some of you may be in graduate school someday, and I hope you don't have a story exactly like mine. But it is a good story. Most PhD programs have what we call qualifying exams. This is an exam that's given to students to see if they're ready to do research. At least that's how it was posed to me in my department. Different disciplines and different departments accomplish this in different ways. In my department, you took the exam at the end of your second year, and it was referred to as the super test, which is horrible to refer to any test as the super test. And the students referred to it as the super test because the professors referred to it as the super test. They would talk about, oh, we have to get together and plan the super test. Like, we should be happy for them. And oh, yes, yeah, so I don't call my exams super tests. Um, it was a weeding out test. That was one of the purposes of it. And you had to pass it in order to be what we call PhD candidates. It was one question, sometimes two, but usually just one. And they gave you seven days to answer it. Yeah, it's really bad. Um, <laughs> I had done pretty well in my coursework, and I felt pretty confident. Um, I worked hard for that entire seven days, and I, I did not say this is a, a suspenseful story. It does not have a lot of suspense, but it has a lot of meaning, so I'm sure you know what's coming. I totally bombed it. A couple weeks later, my professor called me, one of my professors, and said, oh, Darcy, I'm sorry to say you have failed the exam. And then we proceeded to have a five-minute conversation about which I just kept asking her, what? What do you mean? I failed the exam. And she just kept saying, you failed the exam. <laughs> you didn't do well enough. <laughs> wow. So I just I couldn't believe it. Um, I had spent four years in graduate school up to this point because I had gotten another master's degree in an associated discipline. And I was not expecting this. And it was horrible. 
I had plans for my future, and they were predicated on me successfully completing this degree. They just were not going to work if I could not pull this off. Plus, I was really embarrassed. I mean, really, really embarrassed. Everybody I knew that was remotely important to me knew that I was taking this exam, and nobody expected me to fail it, because up until that point, I really hadn't failed anything academic except some random physics test when I was an undergrad here a long time ago. Since I wasn't a physics major, I was like, well, that's OK. Um, <laughs> so I had a decision to make, a pretty big decision. Do I stay and study for one more year? You could only take it once a year, and I had two shots. So I could stay and study for another year and I could take it again. And if I failed it again, they would kick me out. Nicely, but they would kick me out. Or I could quit and do something else. I didn't know what that would be exactly. Um, I couldn't really comprehend what I was going to do if I didn't get this PhD. I had plans and they involved me getting this PhD. But what I really wanted to do was just leave. I really wanted to, my husband to just go down to the school and get all my stuff for me so I would just never have to go back and see those people again and just not show up. That's how I felt. So there is a backstory, however, that um, offers some explanation as to why I was having trouble. At the beginning of my second year in the program, so one year before I actually took this exam, I had my first baby. And my father was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And my extended family lived in the area where I was studying. So I spent a lot of time with them and was very close, still very close with my family. I was just a mess. I was having a really hard time figuring out um, how to be a working mother. That was something that I had not really worked through. And that was hard for me. And my family, my extended family, was just overcome with this disease. Everything that we were doing was centered around my father's illness. Mentally, I had just kind of left. I was still going. I was still doing my homework, attending classes, doing my job. Um, it just caught up with me. I was not learning how to do research. And I wasn't talented enough to be able to pull that off, to just not put in the effort and still be able to pass this exam. So here I was, wondering what to do, and the story of how God helped me make this decision changed my perspective on many very important things for the rest of my life, and I'm very thankful. Um, so I, I, I tend to kind of break things down very logically. I'm a mathematician. I just kind of enumerate things in my head all the time. So now I will enumerate for you. Number one. I only have two things, but I'm still going to number them because it makes me feel better. Um, I needed to understand the risks of deciding to stay and yet potentially fail again, and the risk of leaving and never realizing my plans. I was really, really embarrassed. That is a really big part of this story was how I felt about myself. And, in front of other people with this, in my mind, tremendous failure. Everyone I knew was expecting me to pass. So I sat there in my house that night depressed and panicked, and my overwhelming emotion was fear. Not of being harmed, of being embarrassed for not being successful, and of not having my future the way that I had planned it. I wasn't sure that I could face all those people in my department the next day, much less do it again in a year if I failed again. It seemed a lot easier to just quit. But the Holy Spirit helped me and reminded me that fear could not drive my decision or it would be a bad one. I knew, as Paul tells us in Galatians, that I was to seek God's approval and not be concerned about other people's opinions of me. My decision needed to be based on other information, on counsel, and in faith that God would help me. This did not change how I felt. I was still humiliated, but it is a grace of God, a great grace of God, that we can apply right reason to action even if we don't feel like it. We can allow our emotions to be whatever they may be and still make good choices. So once I decided to ignore my fear, I realized that the risks of staying in the program for me were not actually that big. My husband had a good job. I was not incurring any debt by being in a graduate program and I wanted to be near my family while my father was still alive. 
So it wasn't risky for me to stay and work another year and try again if I decided that failing wasn't really a risk that I needed to pay attention to. However, quitting is not always a bad choice. In fact, sometimes quitting is the most prudent and wise choice. We shouldn't ignore information that might lead us to change paths just so we can keep on the path that we started. But I didn't really know what kind of information failing this test was for me. I knew it was some information, but it just didn't quite seem to be enough. If I could have known the future, if I could have known whether I would have passed again or not, I would have known exactly what to do. But God did not choose to tell me that. I knew and still know that I have limits. I cannot do it all. I can't be the parent that I want to be and the scholar that I want to be and the teacher that I want to be amazingly in all these areas all at the same time. So I just was wondering, you know, is this test, is this God's way of telling me that I have reached some sort of limit in the way I want to live my life and in my intellectual capabilities? I just didn't know. So I needed help. So I prayed that the Holy Spirit would help me and give me wisdom in my decision making. And I should have followed up that prayer with going to get some good counsel. But I did not. However, God still helped me anyway. So the next day, what I should have done was gone down to my office and gone to my professors and asked them what they thought I should do. But I didn't. I went to my office, and then I just sat in my office, and I hid in my office so that no one would know I was in my office, except for my office mate who had passed the test. He knew I was in there. But I just sat there for a couple of hours. Um, but even though I wasn't really doing what I should have done, God helped me anyway. Over the course of that morning, all of my professors came by my office, and they all told me exactly what they thought of me and exactly what they thought I should do. And they all encouraged me to stay. And I realized that the people who could actually help me make this decision were the people who had been watching me for the past two years do my work, and I should trust them. Now, the one person that had not stopped by was my supervising professor. He was the professor that I was already doing some research with, although obviously not awesome research, <laughs> um, but some research. He was leaving me alone so that I could kind of get my wits about me. So at some point, I went down to his office, and he encouraged me to stay as well, but he also was very clear about what I was doing wrong and what had to change if I was going to pull this off and actually graduate. And fortunately, by God's grace, I did not spurn that discipline, but I heeded his correction. For as Proverbs tells us, that is prudent. When I left that day, I knew that God had given me the wisdom that I needed to make this decision. My husband was comfortable with either choice, although he wanted me to stay. I didn't know the outcome, but I knew the most prudent and wisest path. I didn't think for one second that God helping me to make this decision meant that I would pass the next year. I still don't think that way. I don't think that when God helps us make choices that it means he's in some way guaranteeing the outcome of the choice. God's help to me was to help me make the best decision that I could with the information that he chose to allow me to have. So. I spent the next year working and changing and doing a lot of praying. I would get a knot in my stomach every time I thought about taking that exam again. I can still feel the knot. I don't have it anymore because I'm not taking it anymore, but I remember very clearly what it felt like. I thought of how horrible it would be to fail again, and I wondered what on earth I was going to do with myself if I did fail it again. But I had a year. And during that year, I watched my father get sicker and sicker, and I watched my daughter grow and grow. And by the time I took that test, I was still nervous, but I knew that God would take care of me no matter what happened. I had gained a new and more mature perspective on where my future really was, and it was in heaven with him at some point even if my life on earth wasn't going to be exactly as I planned it. 
I also felt confident that I really had made a good choice to stay in the program, that that was a good choice given what I knew regardless of how I performed. I could not predict the outcome, but that was not my responsibility. Being wise and prudent was my responsibility. So I took the test. I'm sure you're wondering what happened. Yeah, I passed it. That's, it's not a suspenseful story. <laughs> but it's really not the point. If I had failed, I promise you I would be telling the same story. I just wouldn't be standing up here telling it to you people. <laughs> I would be standing somewhere else, maybe at a Starbucks, but still telling the same story. <laughs> oh, thank you for laughing at my jokes. <laughs> well, there is a second end to my story, kind of a dramatic end um, and a deeply felt end, but a telling end of God's grace. The day that I should have graduated and gotten all my fancy PhD stuff and had a party, um, I was attending my father's funeral four hours away after a three and a half year painful struggle with cancer, uh, a, a dear and a precious man. And I had also given birth just about two or three days before to my second daughter. Yes, it was a very big time. The big is just a kind of an appropriate word. It was a big time for me. Um, I got out of the car at the service and I saw one of my professors in the parking lot a professor that I had not ever even taken a class from, and she had driven four hours to, sorry, I thought I would get through this whole thing without like being sappy. I'm such a crybaby. The older I get, the more I cry. And it's probably gonna happen to you too. Um, so anyway, she was in the parking lot and she said that she had come as a representative of my department to offer support and sympathy for me. And uh, I knew this woman had two small children, and for her, taking an entire Saturday out of her life was a big deal. And I have not been in very many graduate programs, but I'm pretty sure that that is not normal. So I stood there, and the moment was just full of meaning for me. I had lost a parent, a dear parent. I had gained a child, and here was this woman God's reminder to me that he gives and he takes away, but he cares about me and he will help me and blessed be the name of the Lord. So may you know the freedom that humiliation can actually bring. The freedom of knowing deep down that you are responsible for your choices, not your abilities or your successes. And may you seek to be prudent so that you may have peace and the knowledge that God is on your side. Thank you, and have a prudent day.